Congress member Pramila Jayapal, who's on the House Budget Committee, drops by to talk about the issues of the day. Check it out. Ding the bell. Leave your comments. Tell your friends about it. And please subscribe to our channel. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal is on the line with us, a U.S. Congress member from Washington's 7th District, co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the senior whip of the Democratic Caucus, and serves on multiple committees, including the House Budget Committee, House Judiciary Committee. Uh, Jayapal.house.gov is her website. You can tweet her at rep. Uh, Jaya Paul, R-E-P-J-A-Y-A-P-A-L. Congresswoman, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be with you. It is so great to have you with us. So uh, I don't know where to begin. I mean, you are co-sponsor of the current Medicare for All in the House. Uh, you're also a member of the Judiciary Committee. I, I'd, I'd like to get into both those issues. Um, uh, where, first of all, where is Medicare for All at in your mind? Well, we're super excited. Um, I'm the lead sponsor of it. We just got up to 110 uh, House members who have sponsored the bill, and we're going to be introducing a couple more in a couple weeks. We historically had the first ever hearing on Medicare for All in the House, um, and it was in the Rules Committee. It was about almost a month ago now, and it was phenomenal. It went all day. Um, some stellar witnesses, doctors who talked about what Medicare for All would mean, patients, Adi Barkin, who did an amazing, amazing job, um, and economists who showed exactly what the business case is for um, and the need to move to a Medicare for All system. Yesterday in the budget committee, um, we had a, it was, it was not a hear, it was sort of a hearing, but just with the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, did a report on what components need to be considered within a single-payer health care system. It didn't focus just on my bill, but what was interesting is it had some really wonderful points making our case for why we have to move to a Medicare for All system. And we were able to get a number of members to really point out how health care today costs, you know, $31 trillion. And that's just the healthcare costs were to stay the same, but they're going to go up to six trillion a year, which means that over the next ten years, we're going to spend about fifty-two trillion dollars on healthcare, eighteen percent of our GDP right now, simply increasing, and yet we have seventy million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured, and tens of millions more who cannot afford insurance and are using GoFundMe as their insurance plan. So Medicare for all is. Um, has more momentum than I have ever seen. Uh, obviously, presidential candidates are talking about it. And Americans across this country are saying, you know what, I need health care that allows me to go see a doctor when I get sick, that allows me to have comprehensive care, that cuts out the private for-profit insurance companies um, that are making a profit on our health care, that um, reduces prescription drug prices dramatically so all these pharma companies don't keep making profit off of health care. And this Medicare for All bill is uh, the first bill. It's 125 pages, um, and it is the first bill in the House of Representatives to actually give a clear plan of how we transition to that system. Now, you have, uh, you know, a, a number of members uh, of, well, not just members of Congress, but candidate, candidates for the Democratic nomination for president who are supportive of Medicare for all. But you also have a number of them who are saying, you know, this is just too big. There's too much here. It's, it's, we're talking, you know, trillions of dollars at the end of the day. And uh, really, we just need to do this incrementally, step by step. Let's start out with a public option. You know, that thing that Joe Lieberman yeah. blew up back when they were negotiating Obamacare. How do you respond to them? Well, what I say is that, uh, look, I understand that those bills are just trying to make things a little bit better, but they do not fix the underlying problems of a system that has been based on profit instead of patients. Uh, if you want to fix, if you actually want to provide universal care and you want to, um, and you want to make sure that, that the costs are contained, then you have to address the insurance companies and the pharma companies. You cannot have a multi-payer system and still gain the administrative, you know, still get out the administrative waste that is contained. About 25 to 30 percent of our costs in healthcare today are because of administrative waste, and a lot of it is caused by the profit-making motives of these companies, but also the fact that there are all these multiple payers. And, you know, ultimately, the results, you would think that if we spent the most money 
by almost double of any peer industrialized country in the world that we would actually have the best outcome. Well, that is so not true. We have yeah. we are number one in infant mortality, number one in maternal mortality. We are the only industrialized country in the world where life expectancy is actually going down and not up. And so we have to get to the root of the problem. And, you know, with all respect to the other programs that are out there, a public option would not address this. And in fact, what it would do is probably drive the most vulnerable people into the public system. They are probably the most expensive. And then it would make that system even more unaffordable. So it doesn't address kind of the deep rooted problems. And my bill does. It, it addresses, you know, gives comprehensive care, as I mentioned. It's the first bill in the history. And now Bernie Sanders has followed with a piece of the long-term care uh, piece as well that we put into this bill. It's the first bill to address long-term care. So care for folks with disabilities, care for seniors. Um, it, of course, repeals the Hyde Amendment so that women can get reproductive care that they need. Um, and, and it and it really um, addresses the cost of pharmaceutical drugs. This is something that Mark Bocan, who I know is a regular on your show and is my co-chair, really good friend here in Congress, we have been focused with Lloyd Doggett on bringing down the cost of prescription drugs and really focused on Lloyd Doggett's bill to do that. We have incorporated Lloyd Doggett's bill into this Medicare for All bill so that we can not only negotiate pharmaceutical drug prices, but we can actually have the stick of saying, if you don't negotiate with us, then we have the ability to bring competition into the market by licensing generics on that same drug. Wow. Wow. That's, that, that, is a, that is a huge stick. Now, you are also on the Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee is like the big deal committee right now in Congress because that's the place where impeachment has to originate if it's going to happen. Um, I've heard some folks say that if the committee opens, and not necessarily an impeachment hearing, as in we're going to impeach the president, but rather an inquiry into whether there needs to be impeachment, um, or if they open an inquiry into the possibility however it's phrased, that once that happens, that that committee and, and the House of Representatives itself acquires basically grand jury powers, powers that they wouldn't have otherwise had, and or certainly the, the ability of Trump or the administration to claim that Congress is snooping where they don't belong because there's, quote, no legitimate legislative purpose, end quote, just gets totally blown out of the water, even if it's before a Trump-appointed judge, presumably, because, you know, the Constitution is so just transparently clear that not only does Congress have the right to impeach, but also that the president loses his right to, to pardon people during times of impeachment, which is something that he's apparently been dangling you know, over uh, Paul Manafort and tried to dangle over Michael Flynn and, and Michael Cohen uh, for some time. W is that true? Does, does Congress acquire extra powers if they do that? And where, what's your take on this? And what's your read of your colleagues' take on all this? Well, yes, Congress does acquire extra powers by starting a formal impeachment inquiry. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I mean, being on the Judiciary Committee, I have now read the Mueller report three times. I appreciate your reading the Mueller report. Um, I think it's critically important for, for Americans to see what is in it. It is stunning. Um, there is no question in my mind that the president has committed impeachable offenses, has obstructed justice. Um, but we have to be able to get all of the facts. And we have to be able to lay out those facts for the American people to see. And what is happening now is this president is stonewalling us at every, uh, every turn. He has refused to comply with legally authorized subpoenas, his administration. Um, Barr has refused to provide us with the Mueller report, the unredacted Mueller report, and all of the underlying information. He has stopped witnesses from coming to testify before us. Most recently, that was Don McGahn, who was set to come and testify before us until the night before the testimony, the president said, I am not going to let him come. And he claimed, Tom, this ridiculous, I mean, the letter from the Office of Legal Counsel basically made a an already refuted argument that senior presidential advisors would have absolute immunity from testifying before Congress. This is the same argument, as you may remember, that George W. Bush made in 2007 
when Harriet Myers was asked to come, was, was told to come and testify before Congress, and George W. Bush went to court to say, no, she can't because she has absolute immunity because she's a senior presidential advisor. And the court very clearly actually repeated in the decision um, twice by the judge. Uh, the judge said, you have no legal basis to say that. Yeah, Nixon and tried to claim this, too. Correct. And, and, you know, the reality is Congress is a co-equal branch of government. We like to joke on the Judiciary Committee that we are actually first because we're Article One. Yep. Um, our powers are Article One powers. And so if you say that one branch of government no longer has authority over another branch of government, you destroy our system of checks and balances. And to me, that's the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship. Yeah. In, in a democracy, we have these checks and balances built in because no one person can have absolute power. In a dictatorship, that person makes all the decisions. Nobody has accountability over that person. And that cannot be who we are as Americans. And it is that serious. And so I have said, I came out on Sunday, actually, and said that if Don McGahn did not come and testify before us, then because the president was obstructing his testimony, if this is ongoing obstruction. This is not obstruction in the past that's in the Mueller report. This is ongoing obstruction. If Don McGahn didn't come and testify, then I said I thought it was time to start an impeachment inquiry. I have already been joined by over half of the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee. Um, this is Whoa. not just a progressive issue. Uh, we have frontliners who are coming to us and saying we were elected to uphold the Constitution. And so, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, I think that we are united as a Democratic caucus in saying we have to hold the president accountable. The question is how? What is the best way to do that? And we think there need to be multiple strategies, one of which is an impeachment inquiry. <laughs>